All right. Thank you very much. We're going to begin April 25th, 2003, public hearing. Can we please have a roll call? Commissioner Baca? Here. Commissioner Pinter? Here. Commissioner Odoricio? Here. Commissioner Henry? Commissioner Tedesco? I'd ask that everyone please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. We have a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Oh. All right, that passes. We're moving forward with the agenda. And today we have, um, we begin with recognizing National Vic Crime Victims Week. This week marks an important occasion to acknowledge the impact that crime can have on individuals, families, and the community. During this week, we reflect on the experiences of victims of crime, show support for those who have been affected, and raise awareness about resources and prevention. At this time, Emma Pinter will read the proclamation. Yes, of course. Thank you, Chair. This proclamation, National Crime Victims' Rights Week, April 23rd through 29th, 2023. Whereas Americans are the victims of more than 20 million crimes each year, and crime can touch the lives of anyone regardless of age, national origin, race, creed, religion, gender, sexual orientation, immigration, or economic status, and whereas many victims face challenges in finding appropriate services, including victims with disabilities, young victims of color, deaf and hard of hearing victims, LGBTQ victims, tribal victims, elder victims, victims with mental illness, immigrant victims, teen victims, victims with limited English proficiency, and others. And whereas too many communities feel disconnected from the justice and social response systems, and have lost trust in the ability of those systems to recognize them and respond to their needs. And whereas victims of repeat victimization who fail to receive supportive services are at risk for long-term consequences of crime. And whereas intervening early with services that support and empower victims provides a pathway to recovery from crime and abuse. And whereas the victim services community in Adams County has worked for decades to create an environment for victims that is safe, supportive, and effective, and whereas honoring the rights of victims, including the right to be heard and to be treated with fairness, dignity, and respect, and working to meet their needs rebuilds their trust in the criminal justice and social service systems. And whereas serving victims and rebuilding their trust restores hope to the victims and survivors, as well as their communities. And whereas National Crime Victims' Rights Week, April 23rd through 29th, 2023, is an opportune time to commit to ensuring that all victims of crime, even those who are challenging to reach or serve, are offered culturally and linguistically acceptable and appropriate services in the aftermath of a crime. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of County Commissioners of the County of Adams, State of Colorado, the District Attorney for the 17th Judicial District, and the Sheriff of Adams County are building trust in a victim service and criminal justice response that assists all victims of crime during Crime Victims' Rights Week and throughout the year and express their sincere gratitude and appreciation for those community members, victim service providers, and criminal justice professionals who are committed to improving Adams County's response to all victims of crime so that they may find relevant assistance, support, justice, and peace. And this is signed by all of us. Thank you, Commissioner Pinter. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, the Adams County District Attorney's Office, Rhoda Pilmer, down to the podium to share some remarks. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Rhoda Pilmer. I'm one of the Assistant District Attorneys with the Adams County District Attorney's Office, and I'm honored to represent our office today in recognizing Crime Victims' Rights Week. It is extremely important that you and I and all of us here work hard to support crime victims and to bring their voices forward because we together can amplify their voices and to give them the 
the opportunity to stand up, to speak, and to be heard. We have seen in our work children walk into a courtroom with a stuffy in their hand to take the witness stand to talk about the abuse that they've suffered. We've all seen and heard from men and women about abuse that they've received and having to have the opportunity for them to come into court and face their offender. We've all had the opportunity to hold the hand of the mother who's lost their child to gun violence. We're all impacted by the strength of these victims, their families, and the survivors. It is without a doubt that these individuals that are brave enough to come forward are strong, resilient, and powerful. And so it is with great honor that our office, every single employee, works to provide support to these victims, families, and survivors. And I know together that we have and will continue to amplify their voices by elevating them, by engaging them, and together affecting positive change. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know we have other several representatives from the DA's office and law enforcement offices. Sheriff Claps is here. If you would please rise and so we can recognize you and your work. Would you have any comments to make, Sheriff? Thank you very much for your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. We also have uh, Don Quick, our chief chief judge, is here. Don, if you could just rise. Would you like to make any statements? Thank you. And I will be recognizing the rest of the room, too, so don't worry. <laughs> Not one at a time, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Chief Judge Quick. Thank you for inviting me today and being part of today. I've heard it said that the moral test of government is how that government treats those at the dawn of life, their children, and that the twilight of life, the elderly, and those in the shadows of life, being the sick, the needy, and the disabled. Today we're here to recognize another group that is all too often in the shadow of life, and those are the crime victims. Like most of our segments of our society today and many other institutions, our society has become polarized. More polarized than I've seen in my 35 years uh, in the criminal justice system. Law enforcement, other stakeholders, and judges appear to be under a presumption of misconduct. And with that current polarization, it appears to be the majority opinion in our society that you have to choose between the rights of the victims and the rights of the accused. I do not share that opinion, that a person must take one position or the other, and I encourage others to do the same. We can strive to have a justice system in which both the voices of the victims and the accused are heard. We can have a justice system where there are not repeated and necessary delays, but we still ensure the rights of the accused at every step in the process. We can all work together to have a justice system whether where neither victims nor the accused walk out of court feeling they were denied justice because of their race or their economic status or their gender identity. We can listen to one another and have accountability and transparency for all the stakeholders in the system without demonizing and prejudging one another's actions or motives. In essence, we can disagree without being disagreeable. I'm sure there are many, including people in this room, that, call this, consider, that call, consider this call for collaboration to be unrealistic or a fool's folly. But I know we can do it because we've done it before. The 17th Judicial District uh, criminal justice system has worked together to create specialty courts, a drug court, a vet court, family treatment court mental health court programs and a female opportunity program that serves both the accused and the victims. We've established work release programs so people can be out and bond and keep their jobs pending a case. And the same is true for the Sheriff's Supervised Release Program. We have implemented community correction programs. In fact, the 17th has been a leader in community correction programs for decades. When other communities wouldn't take them in, we did. And it's provided a way for some people to stay out of prison 
and for others to get reintegrated back in the community rather than being dumped on the street with $100 and a bus ticket. We've done all of this and we've done it together. And finally, the 17th for years has been a leader in juvenile prevention programs and juvenile intervention programs. We can work together to have a fair justice system for all if we just don't look at others as the opposition but as a partner. When I was preparing my remarks today, I was thinking about 35 years in the justice system. And what stuck, struck me when I was thinking about what I should put down today is the victims that I've known, the incur in unbelievable courage and grace that they showed. I thought about a brother and a sister who were horribly molested by their dad. And how 15 years later, I got a call from that girl just to let me know she was okay. She was living in San Diego. She was married to a Marine and had two kids of her own. I thought about a dad who was the father of a gang member that was killed in a blood on Crip shooting. And when the trial was over, this man, who, I think he must have been 6'5 and about 220, gave me a bear hug and told me he never thought there would be justice for his kid. I think about a mom out of Thornton that lost one kid to a shooting and her other son was killed in a rollover accident two weeks before the trial. And I thought the courage that she demonstrated just by getting up in the morning and coming to court and not letting her son trial go by without her being there. So I want to thank those in the room who have worked so hard for the rights of victims and to make the system fair for victims so their voice is heard and they're not re-victimized again by the system. However, I want to encourage everyone that we have a long way to go. Too often, crime victims are still in the shadows. And with the courage and the grace and the fortitude that they show, how can we do anything less than given in our very best? Thank you. Thank you, Chief Judge Quick. Uh, at this time, we have other members of the courts. Would you please stand? Uh, how about law enforcement? Law enforcement, if you're working in law enforcement, would you please stand so we can recognize you? That includes victims advocates. How about, I'm going to spell call out special victims advocates too, but law enforcement, thank you for standing up for victims. If we could give everyone a... Now victims advocates, I see a bunch of you out there. Could you please stand? Thank you very much. And the folks in the DA's office, did you stand up with the law enforcement piece? But it's okay, stand up for the DA's office. Thank you. Um, at this time, are there any other leaders or anybody who would like to speak on this matter? Um, and we'll come back up here. But I see nobody running down the aisles. No? Okay. I'm just checking. Everyone's like, no, I'm good. Um, thank you all very much. And at this time, are there any commissioners who would like to make comments? No? Huh? Yeah. Um, thank you all. Uh, one of the things I tell you is Don Quick's words ring true from the moment I was a prosecutor many years ago. Uh, he was the one who hired me and he said, justice is a three-legged stool. You have to work on balancing the interests of the community and the defendant and the victim. And if you're not addressing all three of those, justice can't be served. And I think Judge Quick appropriately identified our need to make sure that we're balanced in our approach, but too often the victim leg of that stool is overlooked and we needed to really lean in and really try to support victims and also prevent victims of the future. And so all the folks that stood up and were recognized today, I just can't express enough the gratitude that I have, uh, that we have and the community has for all of you. So thank you all very much uh, at this time. We're going to come down for a photo. Would everyone please join us with the proclamation? But please come on down. This one has this option I love. Hang on a second. What is it? The 0.6 zoom. So it zooms it out, and then I can go full like this. 
thing gets yeah. everything. Yeah. yeah, which is best for these kinds of shots. All right. Let's see. If we get more people just come in the middle, yeah. that would that'd be bad. Like two rows, we could get everybody. In yeah. The, <laughs> Wondering if if a bear. Yeah, I was gonna say I might get on it. See what we got. <laughs> okay, let's see here. We get inside just to pack it a little over this way, and a little on this end too, on the both ends. All right. Look up at me. One, two, three. I'm going to try one with this one now and see what it does. <laughs> All right. Ready. One. One, two, three. Okay, we're moving on to uh, the next segment of the meeting is public comment. This time, do we have anyone from the public signed up to speak? Commissioner, we do have several people signed up regarding today's land use cases. Okay, so is there anyone that is signed up or not signed up that wishes to speak about something other than land use? Because I'd ask the folks that are signed up for land use uh, to wait till that moment. So is there someone? Come on down. If this is relating to something other than land use, please come on down. You have three minutes. Please state your full name and your address for the record. Thank you. Looks like something out of Ghostbusters. Is there a ghost in there? Close to it. Oh. <laughs> um, my, my name is Ed Ingvi. I've spoken with you years in the past. I own Renegade Oil and Gas Company and uh, operate some legacy stripper production in the eastern part of your county. Um, obviously, one of the issues that kind of tripped everything was the cryptocurrency rules and regulations or the data center regulations that are proceeding through your process right now. And I'm, and I'm frustrated, I guess, is, is some of what I'm here to express today. Uh, as far as I can tell from the process, it's completely being driven by staff. There is not a citizen member. There's not a, a, a fire department personnel, an EMS personnel that has expressed any reservation about what we're doing out there on site with regard to electrical generation and crypto mining um, or data center operations. Uh, the, the staff will recognize that if we're using that generator to do other things on site, whether it be power pumping unit, power automation equipment, power air monitoring equipment, that there basically is no role for the county there. But somehow, some way, when I plug in 30 of these on a shelf right next to it, or 50 of these, this is a this is a crypto mining box. Uh, all of a sudden, now, oh my God, there needs to be rules and regs for this. We need to do a site security plan. We need to do a fire department will serve letter. We need to do a site access issue. We need to do a landscaping program. We need to do a you know, a, a, a landowner waiver, and, and this is if the thing is located on the oil and gas site as it is. Uh, it, it just seems like 
we're, we're, we're falling over ourselves to create something that's pretty innocuous here. Uh, and I would think, if anything, kind of be encouraging to help with what in particular the, the county has this orphan well program. I know for a fact nobody has even seen one of these. I offered to bring one of these into a meeting or two. And, and I've offered them to take them to a site where we actually have them, and, and I've not been taken off on the offer. So the rules and regulations are being completely derived by Google searches and things of that nature. Uh, and I think there's a bias already amongst the staff to, well, we need, we need to regulate. We need to regulate. We need to regulate this. And, and there just was no clamor from anybody out there that is really pushing this. So um, I know there's a meeting this afternoon and a study session. That's why I'm here, and uh, I just I just hope that we can do a light touch on these. Like I said, they're 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 pretty innocuous. <laughs> uh, Thirty or fifty of these might be plugged in in a typical installation of mine. Uh, yes, they use power, but the other thing that you're not going to hear today, too, I suspect in your study session, is you won't hear of any incidences anywhere anywhere in the country about you know a, a fire related issue or or things of that nature, and it just seems like. Well, let's see how this stuff evolves before we really go off the deep end on any sort of rules and regs. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. Thank you, sir. And, and I appreciate that, and hopefully go in with that frame of mind here this afternoon. Thank you. And Thank you. We, we will proceed with our study session on that matter later this afternoon, and I appreciate yep. you watching. Thank you. All right. Is there anyone else uh, that would like to speak in, on a matter not related to the land use? Okay, seeing none coming back. Uh, any elected official communications? Seeing none. All right, do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. We have a motion. Second. And a second. A vote. And that passes. Uh, new business county manager? None. New business county attorney? None? None today. Thank you. Okay. No executive session. We're going to take a, uh, we'll take how much, five minutes, ten minutes? Let's do a five-minute recess uh, starting at 10 o'clock uh, on the land use hearing. Thank you.
uh, uh, reconvening our public hearing for the day. We're now entering into the land use portion of it. If uh, this time we're going to hand the floor over to the staff. Please begin. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Layla Bajlan. I'm a senior long range planner with the Community and Economic Development Department. In the case before you is PRC 2022 20. This is the Clinker Rezone and Comprehensive Plan Amendments. And this uh, parcel is located northeast of the intersection of East 168th Avenue and Harvest Road. So within this case, there are two requests. The first request is for a comprehensive plan amendment to change the future land use designation from agriculture large scale to agriculture small scale. And then there's a rezone request to change the zone district on the subject parcel from agricultural three to agricultural two. So this shows the location of the subject property. It's located east of the intersection of East 168th Avenue and Harvest Road. This is the most northern portion of Adams County is everything north of uh, East 168th Avenue is in Weld County. And as you can see, surrounding properties are um, primarily de developed with single family residential and then there are several agricultural uses out here as well. This shows a closer aerial image of the subject property. Currently, there is an existing single family home and accessory structures on the property. However, a significant portion of this uh, parcel is vacant. And there are two uh, ditches that uh, do run through this property. So the first run runs through the nor northern portion, and then the second one does make up the southern um, property boundary of this lot. So as mentioned, the current zoning on the subject property is Agricultural 3. Our Agricultural 3 zone district is where you'd primarily find uh, parcels that are 35 acres or larger, and this is set aside for our agricultural uses. And then you can have single family residential on A3 properties as well. Uh, surrounding properties are primarily zoned as Agricultural 3. However, there are some Agricultural 1, which would require 2.5 acre lots. Uh, directly to the west and then as you can see in the southwest there is a subdivision down here that is agricultural one as well and then again all the properties in white are within Weld County. The current uh, future land use designation on the property uh, is agriculture large scale. Our agriculture large scale would only support our agricultural three zone district and again this is primarily set up for those large farming operations and you can have single family residential in A3 as well. And this is from the 2022 Advancing Adams Future Land Use Designation. Mm -hmm. All properties that share this light blue designation are um, also have the future land use of agriculture large scale. There is agriculture small scale as shown in green uh, directly adjacent to the subject property. And then there is residential low also located directly to the west. So this area does contain a mix of residential and agricultural future land use designations. So the criteria of approval when considering a comprehensive plan amendment um, includes that the comprehensive plan amendment is consistent with the goals and policies of the Adams County Comprehensive Plan, that the comprehensive plan amendment is consistent and or compatible with the land use, transportation, and open space maps in the Adams County Comprehensive Plan, that the comprehensive plan amendment advances the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens and the property owners of Adams County. So this shows what the future land use designation uh, would be if the request is ratified today. So again, there is agricultural small scale that is located directly adjacent to this site. So this would not be um, something that is not compatible within this area as there's uh, residential low and agricultural small scale uh, right within this vicinity. So when looking at the criteria of approval for a rezone, uh, the criteria of approval include that the request is consistent with the conference of plan, that it's consistent with the development standards, and it complies with the development standards, and finally that the request is harmonious and compatible with the surrounding area. So the applicant is requesting a rezone to Agricultural 2. The applicant is requesting the comprehensive plan amendment and the rezone to then apply for a uh, minor sub or major subdivision to split the lot into three parcels. The applicant is proposing the rezone, comprehensive plan amendment, and the subdivision to allow for family members 
to live within close proximity of each other. The agricultural two zoning would provide a transition from the A1 that is located directly to the west and requires 2.5 acre lots and then the A3 zoning that is surrounding the property which would require 35 acres are larger. Um, several of these lots are non-conforming and do not contain 35 acres but the A2 zoning would require 10 acres or larger. So when looking at the dimensional standards for the agricultural two zone district, the minimum lot size again is 10 acres and the proposed lot is 37 acres in size. And the minimum lot width uh, is 425 feet and the proposed lot has 2,180 feet in lot width. So the lot is meeting both the dimensional standards for the agricultural two zone district. And if approved, um, no additional single family dwellings could be approved until the subdivision application is approved. But the minimum required setbacks for a principal structure include a front of 50 feet, a rear of 20 feet, and then a side of 10 feet or one foot per two feet of height, whichever is greater. And then there's a maximum height of 35 feet in the agricultural two zone district. So here are a couple images of the subject site. This is looking to the southeast, looking onto the property. You can see the existing single family home and then the ditch that does run along the north side of the property. This is looking to the west along East 168th Avenue. As you can see in this area, um, homes are not scattered uh, very far apart. They're clustered along East 168th Avenue. And this is looking to the northeast. This is looking across East 168th Avenue. All of this would be in Weld County. And then this is looking to the east along 168th Avenue. Again, you can see several single family homes within close proximity here. So during the referral period, staff notified all property owners and occupants within 1,500 feet of the subject site. We sent out 37 notifications and we did receive one public comment. This public comment was in opposition stating a desire for the parcel to remain as agriculture and then there were some concerns over the ditch that runs through the property. On the conceptual uh, plan that was submitted with the rezone, the ditch is labeled as a drainage. Um, that would be corrected at the time of subdivision and staff would ensure that the ditch um, is noted correctly on the plat. Additionally, there were concerns that people were living on the RVs on the property. However, no violations have been issued on this property. And then we notified several referral agencies throughout this process as well. And there were no major concerns identified. The town of Lough Bui um, provided comments that stated that they were not in opposition to this request. However, this parcel is within their future growth boundary and their future land use designation on the property is industrial, but that is not um, compatible with what Adams County has the future land use designation in this area. So this case was heard at the Planning Commission on March 9th. The Planning Commission approved the comprehensive plan amendment with three findings of fact, and then they recommended approval of the rezone with four findings of fact and two notes to the applicant. The Planning Commission had questions on the airport noise overlay, so a portion of this property is within the airport noise overlay. However, it is the most southeast corner of the lot. The airport noise overlay would not support any um, additional rezones for residential uses. The agricultural two zone district would not be considered a residential rezone uh, because the primary use would be agriculture with single family residential. The Planning Commission also had concerns on the conceptual site plan, uh, just how the proposed lots were laid out. Staff would work with the applicant at the time of subdivision to propose a subdivision with lots that do meet our standards. So that is not necessarily applicable at the time of rezone or comprehensive plan amendment. And there were no members of the public there to uh, provide comment in support or opposition to this request. So staff today recommends ratification of the subject comprehensive plan amendment with three findings of facts. And also uh, we recommend approval of the subject rezone request with four findings of fact and two notes to the applicant. And I do have all findings of fact and notes to the applicant on slides if the Board of County Commissioners would like to see them. But that concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Okay, any questions for staff from the board? Seeing none, okay, I, I do. Um, but I think I'm gonna wait until I hear from the, um, well actually, can you pull up the conceptual site map? Sorry. 
Uh, do you have the one with the, the conceptual site map with the three different parcels that you referenced from that was part of the discussion at Planning Commission? So that is provided in the packet, but it was not a part of my presentation. Right. So the reason I asked that is to, to see what the portion was that's in the noise overlay, because it's my understanding that our current legal position is that we can't impose <laughs> conditions on a rezone based on the on the presented conceptual site plan. And I know my county attorney will give me a look and send us into uh, executive session if we need to clarify. Well, I think I think Christy could clarify what the regulations say without going into executive session. Thank you. Yeah, so as far as um, conditioning, if it's consistent with the comprehensive plan, in this case, the airport noise overlay is in a very small area of the parcel, um, which will be non-buildable at the time of building permit. Um, so that will be reviewed when they come for that. That, that adequately addresses my concern. Thank okay. you very much. Would the applicant please come forward? If you would please state your full name and your address for the record. And the sure. microphone is yours. All right, thank you. My name is Brett Pomberg. I'm with Rick Engineering Company representing the applicant. Our address is 8678 Concord Center Drive, Suite 200 in Inglewood, Colorado, 80112. Uh, don't really have too much to add beyond the presentation from staff. Uh, it was very comprehensive. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, Mr. Klinker. Um, has this parcel of 37 acres and would like to change the comprehensive plan designation and rezone so we can essentially uh, provide two additional lots for family members to build homes sometime in the future. But the use would remain the same, hay, agriculture. So it's just a pretty straightforward case. And as mentioned by staff, it's a logical transition from the A1 area to the west towards the A3 towards the east. So it's a uh, Pretty consistent with the surrounding character and um, again as noted by staff all the details of subdivision and stuff like that uh, site plan will be addressed at the next stage of the process so look forward to that and we thank you for your time today thank you do we have any commissioners that have a question for the applicant okay seeing none thank you very much thank you Is there anyone who signed up from the public to discuss this particular case we did not have anyone sign up okay is there anyone who did not sign up but would still like to make a comment about this particular case. I see no one coming down. This time I'm bringing it back to the board for discussion and a potential motion. Uh, Commissioner, I, don't know, I missed it. Oh, okay. I'm happy to make the motion here unless I don't want to step on anyone's question. Commissioner Pinter. Okay. Um, so the language here is ratification. So I'd move to ratify. Just looking at our lawyers. Yes, somebody nodding. There is uh, two motions. There's a ratification for the comprehensive plan amendment and then an approval for the rezone. Let's take them one at a time. Um, so I move to approve the ratification of the subject comprehensive plan amendment request PLN uh, 2022-16 with three findings of fact. Second. Okay. And taking a second. That tiny hamster has to run really fast. <laughs> it was approved, <laughs> Commissioner. It's approved? It is. Okay, that's approved. Thank you. So the comprehensive plan is now ratified. Um, it was actually amended by the uh, Planning Commission, but ratified by us, right? That's the official. And then now we go into the next one. Commissioner Pinter. Could I have the motion screen back, please? Thanks, Erica. Okay, uh, I move to approve uh, the rezone of the, su the subject rezone request RCU 2022 46 with four findings of fact and two notes to the applicant. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? Second. And a vote. And that passes. Congratulations. Good luck with your project. And uh, please continue working with staff on the next phase. Thank you very much. All right, next up. 
Do you need a break or are we ready to jump right in? I'm ready. All right, let's do it. Good morning again, Commissioners. My name is Layla Bajlan. I'm a senior long range planner with the Community and Economic Development Department. And the case before you is PRC 2022 15. This is 5990 Washington or 20 Lakes Holding. And the address of the subject request is 5990 Washington. So within this case, there are two requests. The first request is for a rezone on roughly 7.5 acres. The subject parcel does have mixed zoning, so it's currently zoned as Industrial 2 and Industrial 3. The applicant is proposing to rezone the portion that is Industrial 2 to Industrial 3 to provide a cohesive zoning on the property. Additionally, there's a major subdivision preliminary plat on roughly 26.6 acres, and this would provide two industrial lots and one tract. So this shows the location of the subject parcel. It's located northeast of the intersection of East 58th Avenue and Washington Street. This is located in the North Washington area. As you can see, it is directly to the east of the former Denver Mart site, which is now Pivot Denver. And then you can see I-25 uh, to the west of the subject parcel, and then the city and county of Denver down here in the gray. So this provides a closer aerial image of the subject property. This is currently uh, built with a uh, large industrial building. This is the home of the Denver Post. The western portion is vacant, and then there is an existing pond located on the eastern portion of the property. This lot does have frontage along Washington Street to the west. There's Downing Street that does um, stub into the property on the south, and then Marion Drive here on the east that does touch it on the portion. And as previously mentioned, uh, the current property is zoned as Industrial 3 and Industrial 2. So about three-fourths of this property does have the I-3 zoning, the western portion is all I-3. And then the eastern portion uh, where the pond and the Denver Post building are is zoned as Industrial 2. Surrounding properties do contain a mix of industrial uses and zoning. So there's I-1, I-2, and I-3 within this area. And then this application was applied for prior to the approval of the 2022 Advancing Adams Comprehensive Plan. So the 2012 Imagine Adams Comprehensive Plan um, does designate this as an industrial future land use. And all surrounding properties do have the industrial future land use with the exception of the properties to the west where the former Denver Mart site was. Uh, this site has been redeveloped and is now Pivot Denver that allows for light industrial warehousing. And our industrial future land use would support all of our industrial zone districts. So the criteria of approval when considering a rezone include that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and consistent with the development standards, that the request complies with the development standards, and finally, that the request is harmonious and compatible with the surrounding area. So again, when looking at the current zoning, a significant portion is zoned as Industrial 3, and the applicant is proposing to provide a cohesive zoning on the property and rezone the entire lot to Industrial 3. And then the criteria of approval when considering a major subdivision preliminary plat includes the request conforms with the subdivision design standards. So the applicant has provided documentation that demonstrates that there's adequate water supply and adequate sewer service for the proposed subdivision, that any soil or topographical conditions have been identified, that there's adequate drainage infrastructure and adequate public infrastructure in place, and that includes curb gutter and sidewalk. If the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and any applicable sub-area plans, if the request is consistent with the development standards, and finally, that the request is harmonious and compatible with the surrounding area. So this is the proposed preliminary plat that is submitted by the applicant. This would create two industrial lots. Lot one would be created on the western vacant portion of the lot, and then lot two would uh, still remain as the Denver Post, and then there is a tract for the existing pond <clears throat> on the eastern portion of this property. As you can see, there are several access easements that are provided on this plat to ensure that both uh, lots will have adequate access to Washington Street. And it is important to note that the applicant intends to apply for a rezone to Industrial 1 on Lot 1, 
staff did direct them to apply for that at the time of final plat because the preliminary plat could uh, expire if the applicant does not move forward with the final plat. And then we would have um, mixed zoning on the property as well. So the applicant intends to uh, apply for an industrial one rezone at the time of final plat, which would come in front of the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, both applications would come in front of the Board of County Commissioners. So this provides the conceptual site plan that was submitted by the applicant. It shows the Denver Post property remaining on lot two. And then lot one was proposed to be developed with a light industrial building, which is consistent with the uh, development characteristics to the west uh, with the new redevelopment of Pivot Denver. So in looking at the I-3 dimensional standards, the proposed lot size, uh, or the minimum lot size is two acres. And proposed lot size for lot one is 5.4 acres. And the proposed lot size for lot two is 19.5 acres. The minimum lot width required in the I-3 zone district is 125 feet. And the proposed lot one uh, does have 543 feet in lot width. And lot two has 132 feet in lot width. And then minimum required setbacks include a front of 25 feet, a rear of 15 feet, and then a side of 15 feet on one side, five foot on the other. And zero foot setbacks may be approved for fireproof structures. And then there's a maximum height of 90 feet in the I-3 zone. So here are a couple images of the subject site. This is looking to the northeast at the Denver Post property. And this would be the vacant portion where lot one would be created on this uh, subject property. This is looking to the north um, along Washington Street. You can see the Denver Post located on the right side. There are um, several lanes here and sidewalks, so the public infrastructure is in place with this proposed subdivision. And then this is looking to the west. You can see I-25 in the background. And then this, again, is the uh, location of Pivot Denver, which is approved for light industrial uh, warehouse buildings. And then this is looking to the south along Washington Street. This is looking at the intersection of East 58th Avenue and Washington, which does provide a direct access to I-25. So during the referral period, staff notified all property owners and occupants within 1,000 feet of the subject site. We sent out 655 notifications, and we did not receive any public comment on this request. Uh, we did also notify several referral agencies, and the Division of Water Resources had initial concerns. Um, they believed that a water well was located on the site. However, the applicant did provide documentation to demonstrate that there is no well on the site, and the site is serviced by North Washington Water and Sanitation, so they do have public water, and they're not served by a well. So this case was heard at the Planning Commission on April 13th where the Planning Commission voted to recommend approval 5-0 to zero with 13 findings of fact and 9 notes to the applicant. The Planning Commission didn't have a whole lot of questions on this request, but they did want to make sure that there would be adequate parking uh, because a portion of the proposed Lot 1 does contain parking for the Denver Post. Staff would require um, a change in use permit for the Lot 1 if approved, and we would uh, require that they are showing conformance with all parking requirements at that time. <laughs> And there were no members of the public there to speak in support or opposition to this request. So to provide a brief summary, the subject law is meeting all dimensional standards of the I-3 zone district, and that includes a minimum lot size of two acres and a minimum lot width of 125 feet. This request is compatible with the future land use designation of industrial, and it is harmonious and compatible with the surrounding property, as the proposed lot one um, is subject to redevelopment for light industrial. And then there's adequate water, sewer, and infrastructure for the proposed subdivision. This lot has frontage and direct access to Washington Street, which does uh, provide direct access via uh, East 158th Avenue to I-25. And then uh, documentation has been provided that North Washington Water and Sanitation can provide uh, water and sewer for the new proposed lot. So staff today recommends approval of the subject request with 13 findings of fact and nine notes to the applicant. And I do have all findings of fact and notes on slides if the Board of County Commission would like to see them. And that concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Do we have any questions 
I'd would be, you, I mean, I'd be interested in seeing them. Layla, if you could click through. Thank you. Thank you. Here are the recommended findings of fact for the subdivision, the preliminary plat. Here are the recommended findings of fact for the rezone. And here are recommended um, notes to the applicant. One of them does note that the preliminary plat will expire on April 25th, 2025, if a final plat application is not submitted uh, to the Community and Economic Development Department. Thank you. Okay. Um, would the applicant please come down? State your full name and your address for the record. Good morning, Dan Rodriguez, Cage Civil Engineering, 405 Urban Street, Suite 404, Lakewood, Colorado, 80228. Okay, go ahead. Um, so as uh, Layla described, uh, we're proposing a rezoning um, and a preliminary plant on the existing Denver Post facility. The existing Denver Post uh, printing building is in use today, and it will remain in use. Um, the intent from the owner, who is... Um, here, if uh, you'd like to speak to him or have any questions, uh, is to basically uh, rezone the entire site. Currently, right now, there's a zoning split through the existing building. So part of the building is on I-2 and part is on I-3. So we'll rezone it to I-3, and then when we uh, do the replat, we'll rezone the proposed building on the west of the site as I-1, and that is our um, what we're seeking to be consistent with the properties to the south, which are I-1, and the properties to the west for Pivot Denver, which is that light industrial, and we don't need the I-3, so the intent of the uh, owner is to uh, step down the zoning to get approval on that site. Uh, we have the already completed the engineering, civil engineering on the site, and at our own risk, submitted to the county for a review um, because we're so confident with with what we're doing on the site that we're not causing any hardship. Um, there is an existing detention facility on site as working with Matt Emmons in the engineering department uh, with the county. We've determined that a little bit more of the regional drainage goes to that area. So we're working with, um, so basically we're going to improve the drainage kind of some of that residence, the residences to the south and some of that area to the southeast, which all kind of pushed to the pond, which is at that northeast corner of the site, just south of the existing railroad track. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? No? Okay. You said someone else is here to speak? Would somebody please come on down? You, you said the owner would like to speak? If, if you have any questions. Sure. Don't. Please come on down and state your full name for the record. Hi. Uh, thank you. Glenn Chodikoff, um, 6101 Pelican Bay Boulevard, Naples, Florida, 34108. Okay. Mr. Chodikoff? Yes. Okay, and you guys own the Denver Post? We do. Okay, any comments on this? No, uh, we're here to uh, let you know that we support Adams County and anything that we can do to help, uh, uh, we're here to help. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna ask staff for some questions. Ha please have a seat and we may have questions for you. Thank you very much. I'm gonna, if I might, um, I have questions. This was tried a few years ago. What was different about that application versus this one? I think this is a very similar application right. as what was several years ago. I think that the circumstances in the area are slightly different at this time. Um, the Denver Mart is now redeveloped as an industrial. Um, and so I think that this area remaining industrial is something that uh, staff is supportive of at this time. Sure. I appreciate that. Um, can, you, can you tell me, would the Denver Post continue to be operating as it is under an I-1? Printing and publishing uses are permitted under an I-1, I-2, and I-3 zone districts. Right. So I guess my question is, why does this need to go to an I-3? Why would, it, and my question will be for the, if you, the, if the applicant could please come forward. Why are you not just, if, if you say it's easier to, to consolidate zoning for the whole parcel, why not make it I-1 and then you could do the division fairly easily rather than trying to upzone to the most intense industrial use on a corridor that we're still trying to clean up and then have us dependent on a promise to 
down zone one of them later. Commissioner no, that's Harry, a question for the applicant. I, I do uh, know, but the corner that is on Washington Street is already I-3. I understand okay. that. Um, I, honestly, I believe this was just the process that we had discussed sure. with the staff since the beginning. Understood. If there, Layla, forgive me, can, can we, the intent was to keep one of the, one of the zonings on the site consistent with the rezone. All right. So the entire site could be rezoned to I-1, but in order to provide consistent zoning, you would need to rezone that portion to I-3. It, it, they could choose one horse or the other, yes. right? Yeah. And so would you guys be willing to come back, amend it to go I-1 for the whole thing? I, I, I'm uncomfortable making a changing zone for our printing facility. And so am I'm I. I'm just not comfortable with that based on the operation. We own the printing building and we own the Denver Post. So as the Denver Post, and I'm not here to speak for the Denver Post, I wanna make sure that the zoning of that building not be changed. Okay, even if it could be used continued like you promised as a Denver Post facility. I would prefer not to if we can help it. Okay, I understand. I, I would prefer that you would go to I-1 and continue the Denver Post there, and it would be compatible, I believe, with some of the redevelopment and the cleaning up of what we're doing on those major corridors in our industrial area. So if you're not willing to do that, I have a hard time believing this is compatible with the area of I-1, especially on the corridors, um, because I do think that the access to the Denver Post, even if it is nestled behind a different parcel, um, could continue to allow you to operate and I think it's more consistent with what we're trying to do uh, in that particular area in the surrounding community. So I-1 clear, you're telling me I-1 clearly allows for the current operations in use of the printing building. That is what I just heard on the record from the staff. Yes, that's correct. There's, there's a number of heavy industrial uses um, that are contained indoors that are permitted in the I-1, I-2, and I-3 zone districts. Including okay. printing and publishing. Okay, so if that's the case, yeah, okay, uh, sure. then I would be okay with that. Okay, uh, Commissioner Pinter. Yes, thank you. Um, I would also be in favor of making it consistent um, as I-1 across the board to allow um, for the continued publication of newspapers. I understand um, your concern and wanting to have the parcel be consistent. My preference would also be for I-1 across the parcel. Um, if you would like to take a, a recess to chat with your team and to chat with our team and, and look at it for yourself as opposed to the, yeah. the nodding yeah, that we, we can have five minutes. I, I think that's fair. That. We can yeah. give you 10. Yeah. Okay. If you want to take a, even phone a friend. Yeah. Um, thank you. Here's okay. the other question. Legal is uh, to, to, <laughs> to amend this at this point to do a rezoned I-1 as opposed to I-3. Could we do that today or would it have to come back or be uh, with a new notification. I'll let you guys figure that in the next 10 minutes. Yeah. We're going to take a brief recess Thank for 10 you. minutes. Thank you.
Okay, we're ready to reconvene. Uh, we're on the PRC 2022-15 um, Washington Twin Lakes Holding Redevelopment. Uh, it's during the 10-minute recess. I believe staff and the applicant had a conversation. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Chetikoff. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll try to hopefully have understood what I said. So if I'm incorrect, please correct me. Um, it is my understanding that a change to an I-1 zoning uh, for the printing plant facility uh, limits outside storage, and we store trailers on site for our operation of our business. Um, so that does not, that change would negatively impact our ability to operate. Uh, the second to go to possibly to an I-2 limits the height restriction of the building if we were ever to need to add on to the building, which I see no need to do it, but it's restricting us in a manner that if additional printing were to occur, if additional um, uh, structures needed to be added to put another press in the building, then the height would need to be higher than uh, I-2 allows, because our printing facility is higher because of the I-3, but would not be allowed in I-2 or I-1. Uh, we have encountered this in other areas around the country in our other printing facilities, and we need to make sure that uh, we print other papers other than just our own. And so um, if there were other publications, if there were other um, increased supply in Denver, Adams County, et cetera, for need of production, we could need to add on to the current existing building. Now, I understand from speaking with staff that part of the question might be that in the area where we are planning to build the new industrial building, that today we would be approved for an I-3 zoning. We have no intention to have that be I-3. We are having it be done as an I-1 zoning. And if there's a way for us to commit to that um, uh, or not be allowed a permit until that final step to the I-1 is completed, I'm perfectly okay with that. We, we are a large enough company. We have operations all over the country, both in real estate and printing, that our reputation is everything to us. So I don't know what can be done or can't be done, but I think it would be very problematic to change the I-3 downward, but we will commit to an I-1 on the new build. Okay. Um, unless there's a question, I'll follow up. Is that okay? Um, my question for staff. Um, the uh, I, if it were to go to an I-1, you're, you're saying that the limits outdoor storage and height. Those are the two issues. But wouldn't it, could it be a legal non-conforming use? If somebody rezones an existing building, um, the, they would be able to continue doing what they're doing, including the outdoor storage? Uh, since it's exact, as long as they're not currently expanding the current scope of their operations. Right, so they, as long as they're currently staying in the scope of their operations, they would be able to continue. The issue is they wouldn't be able to expand that. So if they wanted to add another floor, they would have to be in compliance with the I-2 or I-1 regulations, which don't allow the height that they have, um, nor the outdoor storage that they're currently doing. Right, but at that time, they could also come back for a rezone at that time to address those issues? Or would it be, would they, are there other mechanisms like a conditional use? Uh, or a PUD that would allow them to do specific ish, uh, expansion at that time? It would depend on what they're asking for at that time. That so, makes sense. I'm talking and, specifically about like a printing operation. Right, right. So printing operations are allowed, as we said, in the I-1 through I-3 zone districts. The problem here is kind of the accessory to the printing operations, which is the height of the building as well as the um, storage that is needed for them to run their business. Okay, I'm going to pull up. Can you pull up the map? Uh, actually, the one you just had was be, would be better. So all those uh, trucks right there, like that's uh, currently on the eastern part. 
um, those trailers, are those, those would not be allowed under I-1? Or, I mean, they pretty much take up that whole parking lot already, so what kind of expansion would even be possible needing to justify a rezone if this is already the high water mark of the use today? So accessory outdoor storage up to 25% of the building area is allowed by right in uh, the I-1 zone district. Right. And so that's, um, now if they're using it a little bit more already because they're currently zoned and we go back and they're, wouldn't they not be a legal, legal non-conforming use? They could be legal non-conforming, and Christy, correct me if I'm wrong, but if the, they don't continue that use for six months, then they would no longer have that right. So they'd have to have that outdoor storage continuously for six months, or well, for more than six months. Right. Um, and then as far as the height concerns, um, I, I just, I, I understand that if there's ever a, a hearing in the future that you would wanna come back and address the issue of the height, I would be more open to that than I would be. Um, I just don't I, I just don't understand how the Denver Post would be expanding. If anything, I've seen them constrict over the years. What I'm trying to understand is, it, if we were to do to a rezone of Industrial One today, that would also prevent you from having to come back for a future hearing. There, you kind of get two birds with one stone now, and you just kick the other one down the can, the other the other can down the road and, because it's speculative at now right now anyway. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I, I do. However, um, coming back later and having a more restrictive use today requires us to go through the process. It requires us to deal with possibly different staff, different board, and having to get and seek approvals again. Um, yes, you're correct. It, the, the newspaper business is a declining industry. Every single year it declines. However, there are other publications that s determine to cease operations of printing, and they hire companies like we own the Chicago Tribune, Tribune Publishing, and we print for many other publications other than the Tribune. And that can happen here as well. And okay. so if that were to occur, in, in a location in the country today, we are contemplating an addition of an additional press for purposes like that. And so for that reason, we need to preserve that ability and to take it down to I-2 or I-1 takes away a likelihood that is possible. I don't have to preserve everything that could possibly happen, but that's likely, it could, it could occur. At this time, I'd like to ask if we could go into an executive session. I have a question about, um, specifically, and just to let you know what I'm going to be asking about, is the conditions that can be added to both zoning and uh, major subdivision plans. Thank you very much. So I would ask to go into executive session. Do I have a motion to? Um, it would be pursuant to Colorado Thank Revised you. Statute 2464024B for the purpose of receiving legal advice. Okay. So moved. Second. Commissioner Baca. Yes. Commissioner Pinto. Yes. Commissioner Odoricio. Yes. Thank you. We're going to be, uh, we're going to take a 10 minute.
Okay, we're going to reconvene PRC 2022-15 Washington 20 Lakes holding redevelopment um, We are back after executive session Okay, um, I will tell you um, my, my concern was trying to get to the point of where we can help you guys uh, make sure that you're not out of conformance uh, with your outdoor storage and your and your height limits and my concern is ideally you know the outcome that I was hoping for would be to get to a lower intensity industrial use particularly as it surrounds to be more compatible with the surrounding area that includes I think going and expanding the industrial three is going to be detrimental to the surrounding area because we've specifically identified low intensity industrial along that corridor and we're seeing a lot of investment and development in there whether it's across the street or even with what you're proposing going from an I-3 to an I-1 next door, I think would not um, be compatible with the neighborhood. My concern is that. I'm concerned about the transition from going from an I-3 to be surrounded by I-1. And I don't have confidence that there's anything. What I was trying to find is a win uh, to figure out if we could add conditions that create more uh, predictability uh, to, to, to help keep this, the status quo of what your goal was while also not creating greater risk that we may not have refineries or other most intense I-3 uses right on the corridor that we are trying to um, to clean up with uh, lighter industrial. And so with that, um, I'm going to be making a motion uh, to deny. And so if you could please pull up the, uh, and I'll give you a chance to speak if you'd like, but um, I will be moving to deny the request PRC 2022-15 uh, based on the as stated, findings of fact, um, it would be, is this the alternative findings of fact? If not, I will make the findings of fact based on the issues and concerns I have for detrimental to the surrounding area, compatibility, and transition. Is there a question? Oh, um, Commissioner, this is Jenny Hall. Um, wanted to give the applicant an opportunity because I think we, we skipped over some con contextual information in the beginning. Um, may may not be relevant anymore. I'm going to withdraw your, my motion. We're going to continue. Decision. We're going to let the applicant speak. And I don't believe I've also asked if anyone else in the audience would like to speak, and that's my apology. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. Okay, applicant. Ms. Mr. Chanikoff. Thank you. Uh, the only other item that I had not addressed, because uh, I didn't really think it was terribly relevant, uh, because it's our issue, not county's issue, is that the reason we did this was because our lender is requiring a lot split in order to allow us to build this building. And they have zero exception. We have even asked them, can we put 100% of cost of construction in escrow? And the answer is no. You may not build unless you have a lot split. And so that is what caused us to come and ask for a lot split, or we would have just come and asked to build a building, and we would have been happy to build it with a light industrial use. But the reason we're doing this is not because we're trying to change zonings, but because our lender is making us do so. And I, I'm not going to speak too much about the lender because this is a public <coughs> record, uh, but I don't think, I think it was a very reasonable request that if we can put up 100% of the cost in escrow, that that would be taken into consideration, and it was not. I understand. And my sympathies for you on that. Um, if you could have a seat, I'm going to ask, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this matter? No one from the public signed up? It was the applicant that okay. had signed up. And is there anyone, one more time, in the audience that would like to speak on this matter that did not sign up? This is your chance. Okay. Bringing it back up. Mr. Chatikoff, I'm I... I appreciate you filling in the gaps on that concern. I'm still concerned about going to I-3 um, on this corridor, so close to the road in the areas that we're trying. Um, we expressed, I, I know I was on the board last time we denied this, and we really did try to address this, and 
we're very open and honest about the need for industrial one in that area for lowering the intensity. Um, and I think we've done a good job trying to be fair and consistent along that corridor. Um, to be able to move the whole thing to I-3, I have some concerns. And so I've already stated my concerns. Commissioner Pinter. Um, yeah, well, just a minute. Hold on. Uh I just would have a question for you as well. Given um, what I'll call the pending motion, um, as Layla hastily gets documents together, um, for a denial um, and the expressed um, concerns of this board that uh, an I-1 light industrial would be more compatible with the light industrial being built across the street, um, a significant investment uh, to create light industrial, and that I-1 is the direction um, that appears harmonious here. And you had previously considered that and discarded that idea as not suitable. Would you like more time to think about ways to make I-1 work for your organization? Yes, sir. Please come up, Mr. Chetikoff. <clears throat> thank you for your patience as we go through this oh, thank you. democratic we, we, process of we dialogue. It. Uh, and that was one of two things I was going to raise. Yeah. Uh, the first is, um, if I think I hear you all properly, you can't commit to it, but you would support a change of all zoning to I-1. Okay. Um, do you have a concern that we're going to build the new building under an I-3 and keep it as I-3? What if we... If there was a way to make that be I-1 right now, mm -hmm. I know we can't, would you have voted, you think, to support it? Would it have changed your position? You know, since I have the mic here, um, what, I, what I would say is it's not a, a comment on your character. You seem like a fine human. It's when the land use changes to heavy industrial, it opens all uses under that heavy industrial standard to that corner. Uh, printing a newspaper is one thing. Heavy industrial is a broad umbrella. And given that newspaper printing is allowed under I-1, um, that would be my preference for both parcels, um, your, the land holdings there. Um, as you have mentioned, um, like all businesses, there's an ebb and flow. You may at some point sell um, this uh, business venture or the property itself. Um, and with the I-3, we have to live with that land use, no matter how much we may like you as an individual. Un and so that's my hesitancy. I don't want to speak for my colleagues, but it's less about um, how much of the Denver Post is a valued member of community broadly, metro area, et cetera, and your investment in newspapers than it is the land use itself, and that's my sole job, is to approve a land use that I think is harmonious with the other uses. And there is a significant difference between light industrial and heavy industrial, and I-1 and I-3. And so um, I would prefer that we keep as harmonious as possible with the direction the neighborhood is headed, which I believe to be light industrial, I-1. Can we condition? Yeah. If you just one moment, we have a staff that's given me the uh, yes. looks like giving both of us the lifeline here. Yeah, yes, hopefully. Um, so, commissioners, I, I had an opportunity to speak with the, the applicant um, during the recess. I think that there are, there are many unique conditions about their operation and this site. Um, they certainly did come to the county in good faith seeking solutions. Um, because of those unique considerations, an alternative approach could be for staff to work with them for a customized PUD zoning that could alleviate the commission's concerns about all of the potential uses that qualify under I-3, but would meet the operational needs and future requirements of um, the applicant. Uh, Ms. Hall, then would that mean I think changing changing this application midstream from what it is now to that sounds like it would be, it would a, be a new application. material change. And so it would require us to deny with some optimism that you guys can work together on addressing it 
to create the win-win scenario, correct? Yeah, I, I don't want to go that route yet. Okay. Um, I hear that. Do you guys want five, ten minutes to discuss again, given mm -hmm. the, the posture here? No. We're going to take a ten-minute break, and okay. we'll be back. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to reconvene. Do we okay, have, let me start with one, a different question. Would you be willing to condition the plant that the current zoning of the existing building stay I-3, that the new building be I-3 conditioned on a rezoning to I-1? I say that properly here's my other question it's not just a concern about that so let me Commissioner Pinter express my concern is what happens when you sell the Denver Post and you sell an i3 building that it currently is used for press you sell to someone else and they tear it down and can you put the list of all i3 potential uses up on the screen let me 
try to explain what my concerns are so you can better understand. So it's a little difficult. So I, I've reviewed this before. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and so my concern is, it, and I appreciate us trying to figure out how to make us feel more comfortable with the predictability of the parcel next to the road to I-1. And to, I, indeed, I, would, I wouldn't have a problem with the I-3 if I could limit the use to what it is today. But I don't know how to do that outside to, in the current legal structure as we see it. If you were to condition the parcel, the new parcel, that it will end up in I-1, mm -hmm. and then we could condition and limit the use of the I-3 to the current use today, I would feel more comfortable. I'm concerned not just about the new parcel, but what happens with the old parcel after you guys sell the rest of the Denver Post to someone else, and I'm dealing with an I-3 use by right, and this laundry list of items that I see here fossil fuel manufacturing and uh, felt, I mean, like all the, these are the highest, most Has hazardous waste treatment facility. Yeah. That's what I'm concerned can about. Can we condition the approval that upon a sale of the existing building to a non-printing operation that the zoning class go to I-2? I don't think we can do that. And unfortunately, it. I will ask you to, with our attorneys, we could give you more time. Um, my concern is that we can't do that type of of, of zoning condition or limitation, um, and therefore, I don't have another option other than the proposed, in good faith that I believe was offered. And I do believe you're trying to get to a solution, and I want to. Right. But I believe a customized zone of a PUD might be the best way to handle this. The only other option would be as if the lawyers came up with some development agreement <laughs> that limits that use, but that I don't know if can be a condition of zoning. I'm not sure that de a development agreement that limits use could be a, uh, like a community benefit agreement where you could limit that. I know it's been done in Denver, but I'm not sure if we do that. What if the property, I'm going to go back to where we started. Let's start. Go ahead. I can't do I-1 under any condition because I can't limit the Denver Post to the conditions of the I-1 for outside storage. But what if we went to I-2? What if we were able to consider it corporately to go to I-2? My only concern then would be, since I don't have an outside storage issue, I have a height restriction issue. Right. If we were willing to consider that. I, my, at this point, I would ask Steph, are, is this another situation that even if it was to be something that we're moving in the direction that we feel more comfortable with couldn't be answered today, correct? Correct. Due to the notice that was given, it would likely have to go back to Planning Commission. And you guys, it wouldn't have to be a new application, but the notice was very specific for the I-3 for the Understood. One. So for matters of public participation and transparency, we would have to continue this and give you time to come back with that amendment to the application, which could save you time if there's a way to address this issue and our concerns, but would you be open to that? I know you can't commit to it. Would you be open to that? We can't commit to it, but uh, any comments from my colleagues? Yeah, I just want to also flag, um, I hear you on the height restriction, and I understand what your, your challenge is um, there, and we'll just set that aside for a minute. Um, with the outdoor storage, it would remain a legal non-conforming use, and we are working um, you know, diligently and creatively to have folks um, have their fleet vehicles, trailers, fleet trailers, all of those things um, uh, be on property for the business use and make that feasible for you. That's something that we hear consistently and is something that our team is really um, at this point familiar with working on, um, giving you some confidence on keeping your fleet vehicles, fleet trailers, you in use, not use, backup, et cetera, um, in that legal nonconforming use and giving you some confidence there. Um, so I, I, at this point, I'm most comfortable with an I-1, um, given the, the light industrial, given the light industrial going on across the street, and that light industrial specifically does allow um, printing and print shops and newspaper 
Um, so that's, that's where I'm at. Um, and I would be ha I understand this is a lot to throw at you. Um, yeah, I'm going to coming in continuance. Yeah. yeah. Today. And you have a whole team, I'm sure that also does this work both in Colorado and nationally. And so, um, what kind of time frame would be helpful to you? Seven, um, seven days. Seven days. Okay, Commissioner Baca, mm -hmm. where where are you, you need at? More time than I need. Okay, Commissioner and, Baca. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate you appearing in front of us Thanks. today. Um, and I believe that there's good faith effort on your part to find a solution. So what I can commit to today is to do a continuance, because what I understand from our attorney is that it was noticed very specifically for today's use. So there's a procedural um, element to all of this in continuance. So I'm not sure we can get there in seven days. I'm not sure what that process I, looks like. I don't like. need that, but that I would be ready in seven days. I understand. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I agree with my colleagues on a lot of this. And, you know, we I have a really strong opinion about some things, but I'll keep to myself. Um, it's, it's really the split building. And so I understand where you're coming from with your lender and um, the risk that they would assume on a split lot for one single facility and what that looks like and whatever you're trying to accomplish on there. So I think today, Chair, um, we look, we're looking at a, uh, most likely a continuance and I would defer to staff on a, a date and time specific. I think they have a notice for this. So to meet all the notice requirements, um, it would be June 6th or um, June 13th, um, keeping in mind that staff probably needs some time to talk to the applicant um, beyond those 30 days to see if um, what the request will be at that time. So, um, I think we could plan on June 6th and if we need to move it to, I want to ask the county manager, were we planning on, sometimes June's a little rough, but let's go with June 6th and if staff needs to change it to the 13th, they can? Yeah, I was just confirming the CCI conference of the week Colorado before. County is the week before, so the 6th is... Okay. All right. We have a, uh, I believe we have, um, based on what I heard from Lynn Bach, a motion to continue to June 6th. Is that correct? I was just looking for a specific date and time. So, Chair, um, I'd like to make a motion to continue. Do we have the. PRC 2022-15, 5990 Washington, 20 Lakes Holdings redevelopment to um, a date certain of June the 6th. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. I very much appreciate it. We need to vote on that, and the, the digital is not showing up. Do you want to do a voice vote? Oh, there we are. Mm-mm. Yep, I did that on the right item. Okay, if we could. Commissioner Baca? Yes. Commissioner Pinter? Yes. Commissioner Odoricio? Yes. All right. The case is now moved on. Uh, next case. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Nick Eagleson with the Community and Economic Development Department. I'll be presenting the Metro Water Recovery IGA. This is case number PLN 2022-10. Uh, the request is for an intergovernmental agreement, or IGA, in lieu of an Areas and Activities of State Interest, or AASI permit. Uh, the applicant in this case is Metro Water Recovery, and they're looking to construct an electrical transmission uh, service sub substation. Um, and just a little bit of background, the areas and activities of state interest permit is governed by section 6-16 from the development standards and regulations, uh, and an IGA can be processed in lieu of an AASI uh, approval. Uh, these applications do not go before planning commission, so they'll only be uh, coming before the county commissioners. Uh, so again, the applicant is Metro Water Recovery, and again, they're looking to construct an electrical transmission service substation 
they'll be partnering with XL Ener Energy on the overall project. A uh, portion of the project area will be uh, deeded at a later time to XL. I'll point that out uh, site plan here in a moment. And they have stated that their current distribution electric service uh, really has limited opportunity for capacity increases and is also more susceptible to service interruptions. Uh, so they are looking to provide, they have stated as a more resilient electrical power system at their, uh, specifically at their Robert W. Height treatment facility. Uh, some of the primary benefits they've included is increased power supply reliability, capacity for future needs and processes, and also reducing annual operating costs. So here's a look uh, at the site. The overall metro site you can see is outlined uh, in this teal color here. York Street to the west, uh, 270 directly adjacent to the east. This is uh, the Suncor facility within Commerce City to the south. Uh, the project area, though, will be included in this uh, outlined red area here at the southeast portion of the site. Now the current zoning on site is A1 agriculture. and is mostly surrounded, as you can see, by A1. The future land use designation at the time of application uh, is industrial, was industrial, and is mainly surrounded by uh, industrial. When looking at the criteria for an AASI permit, we look to see that any long-term effects conform to the comprehensive plan, uh, that the finished product is compatible with the surrounding area, uh, that this does not create a nuisance or negatively impact transportation in the area, uh, that the project is technically and financially feasible, that it does not uh, significantly degrade the environment, uh, also, uh, that they include consideration for any relevant regional water quality plans, uh, that the project must not negatively impact recreational or, or agricultural activities in the area, and also must serve the needs of the, the increasing population. So here's a zoomed in uh, look, again, at that southeastern portion of the site. This is Metro's uh, specific project uh, here for the substation. This is the portion that would be deeded to XL Energy uh, for their contribution to the project. Uh, during the referral, pe referral period, uh, staff notified property owners and occupants within 750 feet of the proposed site. Total uh, 55 notifications were sent and staff did not receive any comments. And those referral agencies responding without concern included uh, Adams County Fire, Adams County Parks, CDOT, Commerce City, RTD, Tri-County Health at that time, and XL Energy. Uh, so with that, staff does recommend approval of the intergovernment of intergovernmental agreement with Metro Water Recovery with 30 findings of fact and one condition. And that one condition is that the operation shall comply with the terms of the approved uh, IGA. With that, staff is available for any questions. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any questions for staff? No. Nope. Would the applicant please come forward? Thank you, Commissioners. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Ben Reuter, and I'm an engineer at Metro Water Recovery. Our address is 6450 York Street, Denver, Colorado, 80229. Um, the reason for this project is, as Nick stated, we want to increase capacity for future build-out, and then also increase our reliability. Um, so, yes. The quick summary. All right. Fairly straightforward. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I do have a question for you, actually. Okay. Um, uh, the, the neighborhood, I sometimes can smell things from you guys <laughs> from all the way from a, like a mile away. Um, is this going to help? Like maybe is there going to be some new like processes or, or any sort of equipment that can help address that nuisance in the neighborhood? Um, apparently, that is not related with the intent of this project. We do need to complete this project in order to meet future requirements as far as regulations go, um, but in the foreseeable future, not specific. Okay, what do we need to do to address that issue? <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not certain in that industrial area, that's gonna be a regulation anytime yeah. soon, but. <laughs> All right. Well, you do have six other, seven other people here. Does anyone else can answer that question for me? You can help control the direction of the wind. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Those are some concerns I have with expanding. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have the powers right now. But those are my concerns about expanding anything for the future of Metro Waste Water Recovery. 
but th that's I you couldn't answer it. I understand. Um, okay, uh, please have a seat. Is there anyone signed up to speak on this matter? There is not. Is there anyone who did not sign up but still would love to speak on this matter? Please come on down. Anyone? No. Okay, we're going to bring it back to the board. Um, obviously, I can't deny a, a personally all this. I don't feel comfortable denying based on the other concerns I have, but I do think that if you guys continue to expand uh, the capabilities that you guys take into account, some of the nuisances of the surrounding community, can you deliver that message to somebody that can do something about it, please? Uh, do we have a motion? I'd be happy to move to approve. I'm going to have to do it on a voice vote. Um, my iPad is now just offline. So, move to approve. Want to read that? Oh, yeah. I have to do the fancy lawyer text. Okay. I move to approve um, the Intergovernmental Agreement IGA with Metro Water Recovery, PLN 2022-10, uh, with 30 findings of fact and one condition. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. And we will vote. Commissioner Baca? Yes. Commissioner Pinter? Yes. Commissioner Odoricio? Yes. Thank you all very much. Congratulations. You did a good job. Please pass mm -hmm. along my concerns. Thank you very much, guys. Have a good day. Yeah, and thanks for hanging with us for yeah. a long day. Yeah, you so, guys did. <laughs> thanks for showing up. Thank you. We're adjourned.